This video is your first introduction to the dot product. It's a really important concept that is used in a lot of different ways, especially in physics and in other fields, but it's really important to understand how to use the dot product and how to do it correctly in order to do so many other things that you'll be asked to do in physics one and physics two. So please pay really close attention, use this video and this conceptual reference material, go back to it over and over again and remind yourself how important the dot product is. It's actually so important that I'm going to create two videos. This first one right now is just kind of purely conceptual information about it. And then I'm going to provide another video as well um, that kind of goes through a few more examples and really shows you how to be really careful and all the steps that I'm looking for when you show work on your homework problems or on your exam problems, how to really show all the steps related to the dot product. So make sure you watch both of these videos. But let's start off with just some conceptual information about what the dot product is. It is a form of vector multiplication, but it's a very spe it's more than just multiplication. It's only multiplying specific pieces of vectors. It multiplies the parallel components of two vectors. And another thing you want to make sure you understand is you're taking two vectors, you're performing the dot product between two vectors. But your answer, what results from the dot product, is actually a scalar. So you should be getting numbers out after performing a dot product. So let's say, for example, I have two vectors here, f and m. And I want to figure out the dot product between f and m. So like I said, the dot product multiplies the parallel components of two vectors. So let's take vector m and let's define the direction of vector m. I just put a nice dotted line through that direction of vector m. So that is the direction that is parallel to vector m. So now let's use that. I'm going to draw another line here. I'm going to bring that line, it's a parallel line, over to vector f. And we want to use this line to help us figure out what is the parallel component of vector f. When I say component, it means a piece of the vector that when added to other pieces will eventually add up and give you the vector itself. So let's just try to find this component of vector f. To do that, imagine that you shine a flashlight on vector f towards that parallel direction. And if you can imagine this in the real world, you would see a shadow emerge. If there is some amount of vector f that creates a shadow down towards that parallel direction of vector m. And so the shadow that results, this little arrow that comes out, that is the component of vector f that is in the parallel direction to vector m. So that right there, that's the thing we were looking for. That is the, the little piece of vector f that lies in the parallel direction as vector m. And so the dot product between vectors f and m would only multiply the magnitude of that little piece of vector f, not all of vector f's length, but just that little piece of it times the, the magnitude of vector m. So that's what I mean by that when I say the parallel components. Let's do another example. Let's say we have vector p and that same vector m. Let's go through those same steps again. Let's define the direction of vector m by just kind of putting that parallel line through it. And let's put that other parallel line that's parallel to vector m. Let's put that at the tail of vector p. And now let's go through the same steps. We're going to shine a flashlight. We're going to see what kind of shadow emerges on that parallel line. So I'm going to shine my shadow down or shine my flashlight on there and try to look for a shadow. The shadow that emerges has that length. Notice that that length is different than the length of vector p. It's a little bit smaller, but it's pretty close to almost the full length of vector p. <clears throat> but that is the component of vector p that is parallel or in the direction of vector m. And so again, the dot product between p and m would be the length of that component of vector p, not the full magnitude of vector p, but just a piece of it times the magnitude of vector m. So you, you can kind of notice here that there's, there's an interesting thing that's happening, that the dot product is kind of accounting for the direction or the relative orientation of these vectors. And that's what is, makes it so much, that's so different than regular old multiplication you've been doing your whole life, because you've been doing scalar multiplication. But when we're dealing with vectors, we have to account for their directions. And that's what makes this dot product so different than regular, regular old multiplication. Let's do one more example. So here I have vector P again, and now I have vector N. Notice that actually, 
I meant to draw vector n pointing in this direction. Sorry. Vector n is like pointing 180 degrees from vector m. So it's pointing down and to the left. So let's go through these same steps and see if we notice anything different going on. So I define those parallel directions, shine my light on vector p. The same component emerges because it was, it was still in the same like parallel direction. And so in this case, when I do the dot product between p and n, their components are they're parallel to each other, but they're pointing in the opposite directions of that parallel direction. Maybe sometimes we call that the sense of the direction. So one's pointing kind of down into the left and the other one's pointing up into the right. So how could the dot product account for the fact that these, these components are parallel to each other, but, but they're pointing in opposite ways? It does. So the dot product is very special. I'm gonna give you the definition of the dot product now. There's another piece that doesn't just multiply like the magnitudes of the vectors. There's another little piece in there that also accounts for whether the, the, the components of the vectors are pointing in the same direction or in opposite directions. So this is the definition of the dot product. Write this down, copy it down over and over and over again. You're gonna use this all the time. There's so many uses of the dot product. So the definition of the dot product says that the dot product between any two vectors is equal to the norm of the first vector times the norm of the second vector times the cosine of the smallest angle between those two vectors when they are drawn tail to tail. So write all this stuff down and then really um, underline, emphasize it for yourself that the dot product is defined with the angle of between the two vectors when they are drawn tail to tail. So let's get a little bit of practice identifying this angle between the two vectors. So I have a few different situations here of these random vectors A and B. And I just want to draw and make sure that we all are convinced of what the angle is between the two vectors when they are drawn tail to tail. So in this first example over here on the left hand side, I would say that angle right there, that's my theta angle. That's the angle between them. It's the smallest angle between them when they're drawn tail to tail. And the next example, I would say this angle right here is the smallest angle between A and B <clears throat> when they're drawn tail to tail. It doesn't matter if you, go, if you start at A and go to B or vice versa, you're just looking for the smallest angle between them. In this case, I would say that is the smallest angle between A and B and it happens to look like a 90 degree angle. So it's possible that the angle between two vectors can be 90 degrees. These last two examples are the ones that trip students up the most. Um, again, you just look for the smallest angle. In this example up here, it didn't actually matter if I went for this one or this one right here. They're the exact same angle. They're both 180 degrees. So this is a, an exact number. I can look at that and I can see that A and B are pointing along the same dimension, but one is pointing to the left and one's pointing to the right. That means that there's 180 degrees between them. This next one down here, A and B are pointing in the exact same direction. They are parallel to each other. So that means that theta is zero, zero degrees in that case. So these are some important ones to recognize because you're gonna see those ones a lot. But that's how you just identify the angle between the two vectors, draw them tail to tail, and then look for the smallest angle between them. And so if you look at this definition of the dot product, you take the two vectors, you find their magnitudes, and then you multiply it by the cosine of the angle between them. So let's identify, let's kind of examine this cosine function a little bit, a little bit more carefully. And you can, you can see a lot of conceptual things coming out of this. Um, the cosine has a maximum value of one, and that happens when theta is zero degrees. Then as theta increases, the cosine starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it just keeps on getting smaller and smaller and smaller at 60 degrees, it has a value of 0.5. Then as you get to 90 degrees, the cosine has a value of zero. So this is an important um, angle to memorize, I would say, that the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. Once you pass through 90 degrees and you start increasing your angle over 90 degrees, then the cosine starts getting bigger, but it's getting bigger in the negative direction. So the cosine values are negative, but their um, absolute values are getting bigger and bigger and bigger until you get to 180 degrees, and that's where cosine has its maximum negative value of negative one. So think about that in this equation here, that if you know the magnitudes of the two vectors, 
this cosine theta is, I would say, modulates or it scales the dot product. So if you know the two magnitudes, you, you multiply those two magnitudes together, but the dot product, you have to remember to also multiply it by the cosine of the angle between them. So this accounts for the directions of the two vectors. A, a, direct, a vector is made up out of a magnitude and a direction. So I see the magnitudes there in this equation. We have to account for the direction somehow, and that's accounted for by this cosine theta. And the biggest cosine of theta can be is one, and that happens at zero degrees. The cosine of theta is zero at 90 degrees, and then it becomes negative, and it goes all the way down to negative one at 180 degrees. So remember those points and, and how the cosine function works, and this will help you have some intuition about the dot product. So let's um, look at these examples here. I have five different um, sets of vectors A and B, and I've drawn them so that they have different angles between them. And let's just make sure that we get how the dot product changes when the angle between the two vectors changes. So it's the same A and B over and over again, same lengths, but the angle between them is changing. So the, the directions of the vectors are changing. In this first example, A and B are parallel to each other. So that means the angle between them is zero. So when you do the dot product, you get the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of zero, which we just said was the number one. So that's why the dot product between two parallel vectors pointing in the exact same direction is just the product of their magnitudes. Now I'm gonna kind of rotate B up a little bit. So it's increased to an angle theta. And let's say for this example that theta is 30 degrees. Now the dot product between these two vectors is their magnitudes multiplied together, but times the cosine of 30 degrees. And so notice that the cosine is a decimal. It's, it's scaling, it's making the dot product smaller than just the, the multiple the product of the two magnitudes together. So a times, or sorry, a dot b is gonna be smaller when theta is getting bigger. Let's keep on going all the way to 90 degrees. Remember 90 degrees was a special one, that the cosine function goes to zero when theta is 90 degrees. And this makes sense here. Remember that the dot product is multiplying parallel components of the vectors. And if two vectors are perpendicular to each other, then there is no component that is parallel between those two vectors. They are perfectly perpendicular. Perpendicular is the inverse of being parallel. All right, and then the next one, okay, so now let's go past 90 degrees. Let's keep going. So now these, these vectors have a really big obtuse angle between them. Notice that the cosine of a number, sorry, cosine of, a, of an angle bigger than 90 degrees is negative. And so this is how the dot product is accounting for the fact that these two vectors might have some um, parallel components. So like the parallel component of vector B looks something like that, but it's pointing in the opposite direction as the parallel component of vector A. And so that's why you're seeing a negative sign. If you see a negative sign come out of the dot product, that's telling you that these vectors have an angle that's bigger than 90 degrees between them, that they have an obtuse angle, that they're pointing in opposite, like not perfect, not necessarily perfectly opposite directions, but um, their parallel components are pointing in opposite directions. And then the very last case here is when I have an angle that's exactly equal to 180 degrees. Like I said, the cosine of 180 is negative one. And so the dot product has become its largest negative value. I also wanna give you some, um, just some conceptual understanding of how the dot product, I said it's really useful. And I just wanna give you a couple examples of how, we, how people actually use it in like real world professions. So um, if you think about um, solar panels, we want to try to get as much light on the solar panels as possible. And so instead of you going out there and adjusting your solar panel as the, the sun kind of goes across our sky, you could actually you know, use the computer and program these things. And so if you were doing that, your computer would actually perform a dot product. It would find the, the incoming light vector and it would also describe the area vector of your solar panel. And it would try to align these things so that the area vector of your solar panel is aligned with the incoming light as best as it can. Because we know that if your solar panel is like vertical and the, the surface area of the solar panel is not receiving any light, let's say that the sun is like at, um, let's say it's noon, and the sun is shining straight down onto your roof, 
if your solar panel is vertical, it's not getting any of that sun. And so you want to perform a dot product there and try to maximize the overlap between the incoming light vector and the area vector of your solar panel. Another example um, coming from like biology and computer science is actually when they're testing like DNA sequencing, maybe we're trying to figure out um, who the parents are of a particular child. They can actually represent the DNA as a vector and then they can pour, perform a dot product between let's say the child's DNA vector and the, the potential father's DNA vector. And so by doing that, they're finding the overlap. They're looking for the parallel components between the child's DNA vector and the father's DNA vector. And there must be some kind of probability, some threshold where they know that if we have at least this much overlap, then it's a good probability that this is the father of that child. Same idea um, also when they're looking for specific markers in DNA, like they know a specific rung of the DNA ladder, um, holds information about disease then they can actually use a dot product to, to just kind of isolate that one component of the DNA vector by performing a dot product between your DNA vector and a unit vector that describes that particular marker. So in computer science, dot, dot products are used all the time. So if you're interested in computer science, get used to performing dot products because they they find information about the overlap between the two vectors or they're able to identify a specific piece of, uh, of a generic vector. So those are just a couple applications there. Um, this last little conceptual example, I just wanna kind of test you to see if you understand the positive, negative, zero aspect of the cosine function. Um, in physics, the most common example that you'll use for dot products is the definition of work. Work is the dot product between a force vector and a displacement vector. A displacement means a change in position. So in this example here, I have a crate that's sliding down a ramp and there's a robot that's kind of pushing on the box so that the crate doesn't like fall too fast. And so let's look at this and just, I'm gonna tell you what all the forces are that are acting on this crate. So I got the robot pushing on it. I have the surface of the box, box sorry, the surface pushing on the box. So the ramp is pushing on the box. And then also the gravitational force of the Earth is pulling this thing down. Let's just go quickly through here and see, is the dot product between these two vectors, which tells you about the work, is it positive, negative, or zero? I don't want any numbers, I just want positive, negative, zero. So to do this, I want you to translate, pick up that uh, displacement vector and put it tail to tail with each of these force vectors. So I did that here, and now we are going to identify the angle between these each of these sets. So this angle right here between the robot and the box, I see that theta is 180 degrees. So when I do that dot product, I know that the cosine of 180 degrees is gonna give me a negative answer. And remember that the norm of a vector is always a positive number, and so that's why the norm of the work, sorry, the norm of the force times the norm of the displacement is always gonna be positive. So it's really the cosine of the angle that tells us whether it's gonna be positive, negative, or zero. In this next one, I can see that there is a perpendicular angle, 90 degrees, between the surface pushing on that box. And so in this case, the dot product is going to be zero. And then in the last case here, I'd say this is the smallest angle between those two vectors, between the displacement vector and the force of the earth pulling it down. And so in that case, this is an example of a positive dot product between those two vectors. Okay, so that's your conceptual information about the dot product. In the next video, I'll provide some more workout examples of really kind of showing a lot of the work and how to perform dot